she's my wife, by the way. Uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> uh, it was actually she who started the rumor of the uh, the uh, the tattoo parlor. Uh, what were you doing at the tattoo parlor, Marsha? Yeah. <laughs> you all didn't see what you just did, but anyway. Last uh, May 21st, we dispatched the most recent generation of Eastman graduates um, out into the world. We had endured kind of an odd spring. It drew upon us pretty suddenly in the form of an early March heat wave. Uh, on March 22nd, we hit a Rochester record of 80 degrees. It was like some sort of weird bacchanal. People were dancing in the streets. <laughs> Tulip magnolias exploded into an extravaganza of white blossoms, and the city, after a long winter that actually wasn't, uh, became wild with color. <clears throat> but veteran Rochesterians, a, a very wily and skeptical breed, wagged their fingers at us to say, beware, and they were right. Um, I recall a snowstorm a few days after that, and spring had tricked us, but then things normalized. Trees and shrubs and flowers regrouped, they reset their timing, as did we, and we retreated to an awesome summer, and we still are. For the new students uh, at Eastman, uh, new to Rochester, especially those students who grew up in the South, maybe in Louisiana or Florida, or the vast stretches of the Southern Plains in Arkansas and Texas, or the Southwest in Arizona and California, you'll notice that we in Rochester tend to talk a lot about the weather. And, um, <laughs> For those from the Sun Belt that are yearning for four good seasons, we'll show you a good four seasons. Uh, for the most part, you'll be smiling. Uh, late fall will be brilliant, uh, especially down on the Finger Lakes. Spring will be resplendent. I've already talked about summer. Did I mention winter? <laughs> but just like the physical attributes of the seasons, there's a mood or personality to each of the seasons here at Eastman. And this time of year is one of our truly perennial favorites. It's a special time our faculty reconvene after a summer of festivals, master classes, or some kind of creative work on a piece of music. Uh, music maybe they want to practice but never seem to have the time to do so during the regular year. Work on books or articles. For many, it's a time of spiritual and emotional refreshment. A few faculty, yes, get a little obsessive about working on their short game on the golf course. You know who you are. But it's a... Put your hand down, Mark. Okay. <laughs> but it's, a, it's really a stirring sensation, this regrouping, like one we experienced just two days ago when we all got together for our opening faculty staff meeting. By the way, this is the only faculty staff meeting that I'm aware of that is preceded by a cocktail hour. And so everyone comes into the meeting pretty well fueled to accomplish just about nothing. <laughs> but this sense of reconnecting is, is vibrant, it's palpable. We all set to work on what we know will be another stimulating year here at the Eastman School. We welcome in fresh new faces and personalities, you, and you students are full of optimism and excitement. Each new in incoming class at Eastman brings with it a sense of renewal, and the knowledge of that very special personality of Eastman that we know will be changed very subtly with your presence here. Perhaps most notably, fall brings with it a renewed sense of why we're here in this remarkable thing called music. Among its many wonderful aspects, music is a powerful metaphor for life. Music teaches us about movement, about how movement possesses rhythm, about that elusive thing called balance and how it's isn't achieved by standing still. Albert Einstein has a great quote. It goes like this, life is like a bicycle. To keep your balance, you must keep moving. And that's just like music. And discovering music, which is what we really do, plunks us into a swirl of almost magical problem solving. Because there's something magical about, magical about trying to get things sonically just right. This artistic search is problem solving of a very high order. No advanced calculus or wordplay will really do the trick. Solving musical problems brings us close to the wisdom of directness and simplicity. We can be as complex conceptually as we want, but in the end, it seems to be about how minimal movements, slight changes in a musical point of view, can sometimes yield astonishing results. There's a great quote in Hilary Mantel's book called Wolf Hall, and the quote goes like this. 
A simple rotation of the object solves a great many problems. Sometimes the search for music can be infuriating. If uh, either we want to play or compose or, or conclude an analysis in some grand, comprehensive, best-selling sweep of gesture that will bring us equally grand satisfaction. But then we learn through constant practice and intensified awareness and a lot of self-reflection that music is sometimes an accumulation of a great many subtleties of small, simple motions accrued over time. Inevitably, though, we also have to engage in practical realities. It's a simple question. How do we translate what we do into something that takes us out of the practice room or solitary studio and immerses us in society, the very source of our music? That place out there is where music really, really matters. Even more to the point, how do we make things work economically? Now, many things comprise what we've come to call the Eastman advantage. One of them is our principled belief in learning the very foundations of music, its repertoire, its driving forces, be they historical or analytical or personal. Another is that we're heavily invested in musical entrepreneurship. This has part to do with the business or monetary concept, but a more fundamental, at a more fundamental level, with an awareness of how our music world is changing, really changing, and how do we then deploy that change into a forward-moving music. It means having the courage to sit down and itemize those changes and stare at them for a while, and the courage to admit that maybe we haven't. And then, what do we do with the process of change? How do we internalize it? How do we turn it into yet another Eastman advantage for the benefit of current and future generations of musicians and listeners? Entrepreneurship, I think, at its very core, is a mindset where one's creativity and inquisitiveness are constantly in motion, conceptually and practically. Because if we lean so heavily on the nature of the way things have been done before, which ends up being kind of a justification for keeping things the same way, we ensure extinction. Entrepreneurship means constantly rotating the object in order to solve a problem. It means looking critically at the listening experience and having the courage to ask audience members, for example, what matters to them. About looking honestly at contemporary behavior patterns instead of bemoaning this. And we all do this, by the way. People's attention spans have become microscopic, or the public is only interested in cheap pap, or nobody's interested in the long form anymore. We have to embrace the prospect that the repertoire, maybe, that we considered so sacred, maybe when we went to school, might in fact be evolving into quite another basic repertoire. Our own version of the great books debate. Entrepreneurship means being aware of traps, some that we set, in fact, for ourselves, like bemoaning the current state of affairs or lack of appreci appreciation for the arts. Classical music sometimes begins to resemble that cartoon character, Eeyore, the gloomy donkey in Winnie the Pooh who seems to sing, you know, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I guess I'll go eat worms. But rather than looking at change as the bane of our existence, um, we must see it as a set of brilliant opportunities. These opportunities present that great future for music for this generation, for you, our young music students. I'm in, in the midst of reading a fascinating book by Walter Isaacson on uh, its biography of Albert Einstein. Isaacson, you may know, is the author of the much ballyhooed biography of Steve Jobs. Now, I've just slogged through chapters six and seven of the Einstein book, and I say slog because this is where Isaac, Isaacson tries to explain in terms that scientific simpletons like me can understand the basics of Einstein's physics work. You know, simple rudimentary things like light propagating ethers or Brownian motion or light quanta, the molecular theory of heat or special relativity. For you new undergraduates, when you're screaming some night this fall about the confusing nature of a French sixth chord or some bizarre tonal relationship, pick up this book and go to chapter six so you can find out what complexity is really about. For Einstein, back in 1905, there was a four-month period of almost unbelievable heated intensity. Einstein was a mere patent officer, and back in those historic four months, to quote Isaacson, he devised a revolutionary quantum theory of light, helped prove the existence of atoms, explained Brownian motion, upended the concept of space and time, and produced what would become science's best-known equation, which of course we now know to be E equals mc squared 
Energy equals mass times the velocity of light squared. Einstein had single-handedly upended the world of physics as it was known, all while enduring an astonishing number of hardships, rejections for teaching positions. Remember that when he wrote these papers, he didn't hold an exalted position in the academy. In fact, he held no position in the academy for a very long time living not on lot, not much money, and going through a very messy divorce, and by the way, playing string quartets on the weekend. The spectacular content and ramifications, though, of those papers being what they were and are, had not Einstein seized uncertainty and change as an opportunity, the world might still be stuck. Einstein was transformation personified his curiosity driving, his intuition on fire, but informed by everything he had gathered before. There's an alarming quote from Einstein on intuition. He said, a new idea comes suddenly in a rather intuitive way, but intuition is nothing more than the outcome of earlier intellectual experience. And so this is one of my points for what we do here at Eastman, this fierce combination of not just music, but music making, or just music making, but it's how and it's why its sources of music feeling and its form, and adding in the practical dimension of making your music matter. How to make music matter not just for the informed among us, but for those with whom we want to share our basic enthusiasm for music's greatest puzzles and pleasures. I'm afraid we've not done such a good job at translating our personal enthusiasm for what we hear as a great piece of music into the hearts and minds of those we feel are missing out on one of the world's great experiences. We can blame the collapse of the public school music programs or the world Washington popular culture, but that translation issue is a key one for us. We have to retool our stage. We must become engaged in our communities, not, not on our terms, but on theirs. We must look at 2012 as a potential breakout year in spite of what appear to be some very, very dark economic realities. We cannot accept the status quo. Einstein's basic drive, his uncommon restlessness, his almost reckless desire or distaste for accepting things as they are, made him one of the 20th century's great entrepreneurs. Now, aside from my feeble capacity to understand his physics, I've drawn from this reading some formidable lessons, not the least of which was reading how Einstein constantly rotated the object slightly to solve problems, and his astonishing cheerfulness in the face of some big, bad obstacles. So we turn to the new students here at the Eastman School of Music in the fall of 2012, and we welcome you. We welcome your enthusiasm, your brilliance, energy, your fire, your fresh eyes and ears and minds and music. I encourage you to immerse yourselves in the intensity of the Eastman experience. But you also have an unprecedented opportunity this fall to learn of the many facets, for example, of Claude Debussy as we unveil the Debussy Festival. This festival encapsulates much of the breadth of the Eastman experience, from performances and lectures, from the common to the uncommon, across the whole sweep of Eastman. I encourage you also to get out often and immerse yourself in the riches of what the university and the city have to offer. From the riches of the Sibley Library, to Rush Reese, to your fellow students on the River Campus, to the stimulating riches of the Memorial Art Gallery, the George Eastman House, the Thrilling Corning Museum, the Strong Museum of Play, Jiva Theater, the first ever Fringe Festival this next week, the all of it. It is through these very human experiences that you deepen your music and force conversations about what you do and why and how so that this elusive audience can be brought into your fold and likewise you into theirs. I suggest these initiatives because I feel they're right, but I also suggest these initiatives because I've learned rather abruptly that time's a lot shorter than you think. Relish it, seize it, claim it as your own, fill up your time with great things. Each day, do something astonishing with your time and make it immediate. I constantly hear a voice inside my head saying, don't show me your old consequences, show me your new ones. We're here to create grand new consequences for the world of music. To our students and also the faculty and our staff, welcome to Eastman, welcome to the new year. Thank you very much.